Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Sherman Oaks Homeowners Association Community Meeting for May 2021. My name is Bob Anderson. I am filling in tonight for Richard Close, who was called away and, and is here with us, but not uh, audio, only audio, and it makes it a little difficult to run the meeting. So just a few ground rules for the meeting. We have several uh, very interesting speakers tonight, including the new commander of the Valley Bureau for LAPD and our keynote speaker, Council Member De Leon. Uh, if you have questions for Council Member De Leon, not anybody else, but just the Council Member De Leon, uh, please type them into the Q&A box. A few of you sent questions ahead of time, and that's great. We have those. Just to let everybody know, we do not use the raise hand function. So uh, if you raise your hand, nothing's going to really happen. So if you want to ask a question, type it in. And we have a person, Jay Weitzler, who you see on the screen, who is going to be handling all the questions. And we'll pick the ones that we have time to ask the council member. So having said all that, I'm going to go through and have, have some self-introductions by our Sherman Oaks Homeowners board members. And Jules, we'll start with you. Be sure to unmute. Okay, uh, my name is Jules Fear. I'm Vice President of the Chairman of Tomos Association. And I'm also Honorary Mayor of Sherman Oaks. And congratulations to the Councilman De, De Leon on your appointment and uh, well-deserved. Thanks, Jules. Next, John Eisen. Hi, I'm John Eisen. I'm Treasurer of the Sherman Oaks Homeowners Association. I wanted to speak briefly about the lawsuit that I'm sure you are all aware about. A group of residents and business owners in Skid Row sued the city of Los Angeles and the county of Los Angeles due to the homelessness crisis. And Judge Carter, who you may have heard of, issued a preliminary injunction ordering that basically Skid Row by the middle of October of this year uh, be cleared. Everybody who lives on Skid Row, according to the order, is to be offered housing. Women and children first, then families, and then the remainder. Uh, in addition, everyone is to be offered mental health services and substance abuse um, help. Yep. This okay. order I'm the care uh, has been Thank appealed. Introducing my by, uh, I'm sorry. You're, you're the care partner. My assistant. So this order has been appealed by the city of Los Angeles and the county of Los Angeles and is, is not in effect. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal is going to be hearing uh, the matter at some point in time. Uh, I'd like to ask the council person, on behalf of the city, was it the decision of the city council or the mayor or the city attorney to appeal? And if it was the city council, when he talks, if he could answer this, was, uh, was it unanimous among the city council members to vote for the appeal? John, what uh, I'm going to ask is when we get to, when, when it's my opportunity to speak, yes. and, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll definitely share a few words with each and every one of you. And when we get to the Q&A, if, if John, through the chair, obviously Bob, you know, give me that friendly reminder on the litigation, current litigation that's pending before us, I'll, I'll be more than happy to answer the question. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Maria, can you introduce yourself? Then I'll let you talk about your, your topic a little later. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Maria Pablo Calvin, and I'm the chair of the Legislative Committee for SOHA. Jay, can you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Jay Weitzler. I am secretary uh, of the board and, of course, a board member. I'm also the liaison with the tree people and, uh, excuse me, the Hillside Federation. And last night we had a, uh, uh, 
a speech, uh, speaker from the tree people. Her name was Courtney Gross, and she described what the tree people do. And as you know, they are our neighbors at the top of uh, Coldwater Canyon and, and uh, Mulholland. I'd like to encourage everybody here to go on to treepeople.org and you'll see a whole bunch of different buttons, but consider volunteering. They, they have all kinds of good programs. And if you're interested in preventing a negative climate change, uh, that can, they can help uh, in both planting trees and in the nursery program that they have. And they have a whole variety of programs, educational as well as working with the actual trees. So go on to treepeople.org, it's pretty simple and uh, see if you have time to volunteer. That would be just terrific. Thanks, Jay. Matt Epstein, is a, he's not on video, but he's on audio. Can you introduce yourself? And I know you have a few words to say. Yes, hi, everybody. Uh, this is Matt Epstein. I'm Vice President of the Sherman Oaks Homeowner Association. Um, I'm calling remotely today because I'm on the road, so I could not uh, uh, jump on the, the audio por portion of it. Um, so Richard uh, Close had asked me to also give a little bit of an update as far as the happenings on the pulse of uh, of uh, the restaurants in Sherman Oaks and in in uh, Studio City. As far as uh, since one of the hats I wear, I I do own, uh, own a restaurant. Uh, Vitello's been around since 1964. Um, the restaurants um, are still struggling um, if, uh, for a lot of reasons, um, partly because of um, um, well, the, the, I mean, the, there, there's a lot of reasons. I'm not going to get into the politics of, of, of why a lot of them are suffering. But um, there are some new restaurants coming to Sherman Oaks. There's some new restaurants coming to Studio City. Um, some, uh, there's quite a few restaurants that uh, uh, did shut down um, uh, in the area. Um, the biggest problem that restaurants have right now is uh, the fact that um, because this, this, this state and because the feds are still um, uh, supporting the um, uh, the workman's compensation. A lot of people uh, are finding it that they do not want to come back to work yet. And it's also, um, there's some some unevenness in healthcare. So I'm sorry, not healthcare, in uh, childcare. So a lot of the folks can't get childcare, so they can't come back to work. Um, and so it's, it's, it's very difficult. It's also very difficult, more difficult in uh, than a lot of people thought it was going to be is because the minimum wage has gone up. Um, you know, the, the reality, there, there's a huge ripple effect with the minimum wage being at, at $15 an hour or very close to that right now in the city. Um, the, that is the minimum, which means the, the first tier folks are getting that, but it means that everybody across the board is also uh, demanding higher wages. And so a lot of restaurants can't open up, uh, you know, uh, additional shifts, can't, you know, can't uh, open up additional tables, which they tip, which they need desperately because uh, they can't afford to pay them. And, or, or, or there are just not enough people out there that are willing to work. So um, there, you know, uh, I know that Brad who runs uh, Vitello's has been desperately trying to open up for lunch, uh, and hopefully we'll be opening up for lunch in um, in June. But the reality is, folks, that it's it's super important to support your local restaurants, but also um, don't get sticker shock when you see some of the prices, because uh, and every single restaurant that's going to survive has got to be has got to raise their prices. Uh, the food costs are, are going up, the labor costs are going up, and um, that's just it's it's a it's it's simple mathematics so that's the the basic pulse it does it's not it's not a good it's not a good report um but it is it, it's it's the report that's uh, what's happening with restaurants in sherman oaks and studio city thanks matt and i see our board member tom glick just joined uh, tom can you just introduce yourself please hi tom glick um board member hi hi to everybody did that come through? <laughs> that came through. That's great. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Sorry Thanks, I'm late. Um, no, no problem. Uh, I now have the honor uh, of introducing the new commander of the Valley Bureau. That's the entire LAPD Bureau for the San Fernando Valley. And that's Commander Alan Hamilton. And he's going to say a, a few words to us. And then we have our two 
uh, senior lead officers who are going to join him and say a few words after that. So go ahead, Commander Hamilton. Yeah, well, Bob, thank you for having me tonight. Um, I um, am happy to be back here in uh, the San Fernando Valley. I've, uh, I've actually been here um, as the assistant commanding officer since December of 2018. And uh, that followed my stint investigating the officer involved shootings and other serious uses of force uh, for the department. Um, you know, I'm, I'm glad I'm, I'm able to come back here to uh, the Valley, but in particular, you know, my, uh, my career has taken me through Sherman Oaks a number of times. Um, I actually hit the ground in Sherman Oaks in August of 1991 originally. And my, uh, my best friend um, since junior high school actually used to live in Sherman Oaks, uh, not too far from Woodman and Ventura. So um, uh, glad to always, of course, be back in the uh, community. Um, it's a very large community. Uh, it's uh, basically the land size is the size of the city of Chicago. And I think the census is going to have a somewhere around 1.8 million people. So um, sizable chunk of real estate, sizable population. We have seven divisions that cover the area. I'm not going to get too much into the history necessarily. Um, but our, our seven commands try to service the, uh, the valley uh, as best we can with our, uh, with our resources that we have. Um, I actually was uh, in Van Nuys earlier today uh, discussing a couple of things with uh, Captain Hearn. Uh, Phil Hearn is the captain for uh, Van Nuys Division, which covers all of Sherman Oaks. And um, I, you know, I, I addressed some things with him that I, I would like to see uh, taking on more importance in, in Van Nuys and in Sherman Oaks. And uh, we're looking at uh, trying to get a handle on some of the crime increases that we've had. Um, I know there have been concerns about some of the um, kind of uh, incidents that have caught the attention of the media going on in Sherman Oaks. Um, there was a, a shooting of particular concern back a few months ago at an illegal casino. Um, and then more recently, of course, there was the triple shooting uh, at the bar over on Woodman. Um, we continue to investigate uh, those incidents uh, in, in the case of the most recent shooting. Um, I think we have some, some good information. We do not have a suspect in custody yet. Uh, we do have good information regarding what occurred though, and we continue to work those leads uh, as well. Uh, the one thing I can tell you about the, uh, the Woodman uh, incident is it uh, did not involve anyone from the community. So the suspects and the victims were not from this area, and uh, we are continuing that investigation as well. Um, I know there's a lot of concern, and I'll just briefly address it regarding Orange Delight. Uh, we have no evidence at this time, although there was a, a lot of social media and it went viral. Uh, we have no evidence at this time that that was related to the terrible incidents over the hill that occurred following the, uh, the march, uh, which was for the most part uh, peaceful over at the Israeli consulate. Um, unfortunately, uh, some members that were involved in some of the marches and demonstrations throughout the day uh, stuck around the area through the night and were engaging in criminal activity through the night. And uh, that activity is now being investigated as a very serious hate crime. And um, that, can, that investigation continues um, with our West Bureau assets. And uh, we have offered assistance as well uh, on the technology front. And we are trying to do whatever we can to uh, assist West Bureau and the other members of the department in that investigation. Um, I will say very briefly that uh, that type of activity will not be tolerated in the San Fernando Valley. And if we become aware of it, uh, we will immediately move to uh, stop that type of activity and take those suspects into custody and prosecute them to the fullest extent of the law. And that goes for both sides. Um, we, we cannot have that type of activity occurring and mushrooming here in the San Fernando Valley. And as the um, top law enforcement officer in the San Fernando Valley, I will not allow that to occur out here from any, from either group and from any, either perspective. Um, I wanna have a peaceful exchange of ideals out here. Uh, I think we could be more mature and handle that a little bit better on this side of the hill. And I do not expect that we're going to have that type of activity out here. With that being said, uh, working closely with our Office of Operations, we are taking steps to deter that type of activity. So you will see us uh, having a higher posture in the community, following the, uh, the demonstrations and the marches that are occurring over the hill. Uh, you will see us taking preventative measures on this side of the hill to make sure that activity does not occur in the valley because we're not gonna allow that to come out here. Um, 
But at this time, we, we do not have any evidence that the Orange Delight incident was related to either of those other incidents or related to the march or related to any type of hate crime. At this point, it appears to be a regular window smash burglary. Um, we, we may determine, uh, you know, through additional evidence that that is not the case, but at this time, that is what it appears to be. Um, I, I do want to express a, a little bit of concern, though, regarding the, uh, the crime numbers, certainly. You know, um, I, I'm very concerned regarding uh, our violent crime in the Valley. In particular, the Van Nuys Division, um, you know, we have a 130% increase in victims being shot in Van Nuys Division, of which obviously everything on the South End is the majority of it is Sherman Oaks. You have a small sliver of Studio City, and uh, you have a little bit, um, you know, a little bit of the uh, Encino area just at the board over there at 405. Um, really, I would call it all Sherman Oaks, but um, we're concerned about about the violence and the number of uh, victims being shot and the number of shots fired incidents. Um, our aggravated assaults are up. Um, unfortunately, the San Fernando Valley remains the capital of road rage in Southern California, and we're trying to get a handle on that as well. Uh, you may have seen some of our social media earlier this year in March and April when we had a very, very obvious uptick in um, those types of uh, ag those types of incidents as we were kind of slowly coming out of the COVID uh, era, going into the vaccination phase. We started seeing more road rage, and we put social media out asking people to please be patient uh, behind the wheel. Uh, we have an uptick in burglaries, uh, a very small one. This is something I'm trying to hit on, uh, though, that is very important. We continue to be plagued in the San Fernando Valley with Grand Theft Auto, where people leave their keys in their car. Now, now I know that sounds silly, but because we have so much tandem parking, you know, parking where people have to move their cars, et cetera, people are leaving their key fobs in the vehicle. A vehicle with a key fob left in it is not too hard to discover i.e. you're blocking another car. Uh, it's very easy to break a window, jump in the car, and just start the car by pressing on the brake and hitting the start button. Um, I'm going to make the same plea. Please share with your neighbors. Um, do not leave keys in the vehicles. Um, they, they are, they're being stolen at an, uh, an alarming rate in the valley. And in Sherman Oaks, uh, it's also a, a problem. And in Van Nuys Division, we're up 30% in Grand Theft Auto. And that's something we have a little bit of control over. Um, other than that, I will leave the uh, the rest of the information to um, your senior lead officer, Jose Saldana, and your acting senior lead officer, John Azarian, uh, who are going to do um, an update for the Sherman Oaks area specifically. Um, I will remain on the call as long as I can in case anyone has any other questions regarding the um, uh, law enforcement issues for the Sherman Oaks area. Bob, thank you very much for inviting me tonight. Thank you, Commander. And I've put uh, Jose and John on the screen. So Jose, why don't you start and fill us in? Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, Commander. Um, uh, officer Soldana, I'm the senior lead officer for the southern portion of Sherman Oaks, which is basically the green uh, screen in the back. Uh, I cover pretty much everything south of the 101 freeway uh, up to Mulholland between Coldwater Canyon and Sepulveda. Uh, yes, we had a few incidents. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I've been working closely with Alex uh, from uh, Raman's office, our, our field manager, and I've uh, been uh, on, on some events. Uh, uh, also, our prior uh, acting senior lead officer, Officer Magana, uh, with the assistance of, uh, of them and uh, Alex, we were able to clear uh, Ventura and Stern, one of our, it was a, a homeless encampment. Uh, uh, four individuals were placed into homes with their assistance. Uh, and to, um, and, and that Stern and Ventura has been cleared. So that's very good. I know we have another issue with another homeless person on Ventura and Sepulveda, and we're working on that one to try to place her. Um, but overall, the shooting that occurred on Woodman and uh, on at the Woodman, uh, it's still being under investigation. Uh, investigation, and uh, our um, uh, my my property crimes year to date is actually down for the Sherman Oaks area with the Green Party. I'm actually down at two point about two point two five percent from last year. So it's a, a we're doing we're doing real good. Uh, obviously, Commander Hamilton uh, spoke about our violent crime, and just in Sherman Oaks, we're about a 115% increase from last year. So it is ha it has to do a lot with the road rage. Uh, a lot of restaurants are being opened. 
that are, you know, causing uh, some shootings, aggravated assaults. So we are still working closely with the community members and we're the detectives to try to solve some of these problems. Uh, for right now, uh, Officer Magana has gone back to patrol and we have our, our acting senior lead officer, John Azarian. Uh, I'll have him introduce to you guys who covers the pink area, the 63s area, just above my, the, the map. Go ahead, John, you can unmute Good yourself, evening, thanks. Everybody. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm John Azarian, I'm the acting senior lead officer for the northern part of Sherman Oaks. Um, my, uh, in my area, uh, my violent crime and my part of one crime has been up. Uh, a lot of it has to do with burglary uh, for motor vehicles and theft from vehicles. And a lot of the issue is uh, people leaving valuables and uh, items inside, uh, visibly inside vehicles. Um, and it, I've actually created a flyer for people to uh, pass that out. I, I talk to a lot of community members. I educate them on not leaving any valuables behind. Um, uh, individuals will smash windows for any little item uh, left behind inside a vehicle. Um, and, and also uh, with the uh, stealing of vehicles, uh, a lot of delivery drivers uh, will leave their keys inside the vehicles to make quick deliveries and uh, they'll have their vehicles taken. Um, and th that's uh, part of the reason why a lot of our uh, grand thefts have been going up. Um, and another thing I want to bring up is uh, we're having a community meeting in, in, at Sherman Oaks Park, Saturday, June 12th. Uh, there's actually fire going around. I'll uh, show it to you guys right here. Um, it's uh, walk your dog with the cop. Um, the event is going to start at 8 a.m. at Sherman Oaks Park, uh, and uh, we don't have a, a end time at this at, at this time. Uh, that's all I have. I've this is only my uh, second week. Uh, just a few days that I've been here, I've been trying to keep up and catch up to uh, emails, phone calls. Uh, I've been going out meeting with the community as much as I can. Uh, just trying to resolve a lot of the quality of life issues and helping out the community as much as I can. Um, and uh, that, that's all I have right now. Is there any questions from the panel? Oh, that's, we're all set, John. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you, Commander. Thank you, Jose. And we're going to go to Andy Solomon, our neighborhood prosecutor. Go ahead, Andy. Thanks, Bob. Hi, everyone. My name is Andy Solomon. I'm the neighborhood prosecutor for Van Nuys and Sherman Oaks area. Uh, I'm from the city attorney's office. The neighborhood prosecutor handles problems that traditional prosecution may not be able to resolve um, holistically. Uh, I'm here to talk to you guys about two things. I know Commander Hamilton's touched upon both. So I won't, he kind of took the wind out of my sails. I'll be honest, we didn't chat before this, but um, from my point of view, I wanna talk to you about the Woodman and I wanna talk to you about the uh, things like the Orange Delight and, and those kinds of incidents. The Woodman shooting, uh, I don't want to say too much, but I'll tell you that the week that it happened, Officer Saldana and I met with LAPD Van Nuys Vice. We met with Alcohol and Beverage Control. We met with um, Council District 4. We met with, uh, obviously, the investigator of the shooting itself. And we discussed not only what happened that day, but what are factors that we believe created an environment that could allow such a thing to happen, especially in Sherman Oaks, especially with people that were out of towners. So um, I don't wanna get into details. There are plans in place to dig deeper into that, to uh, focus on preventative measures, to see what caused it, what are the factors that led to it and what can we do about those? Um, so we are dealing with the Woodman and uh, that's gonna be continuing on for quite a while. That's a project that I've taken on. The other thing I want to talk to you guys about, there are a bunch of things, but I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, incidents like the Orange Delight um, or incidents that are believed to be hate incidents, even if it's not a hate crime necessarily, you're not sure. If there is a hate incident, especially given this current environment, please call the police. What I'm hearing is I'm hearing things through social media, people texting me. What's going on over there? What's happening? Officer Soldana and I spent the day you know going back and forth about this issue to determine what's going on we, you need to call if you know of something that happened call the police let them know you can call me but I, i'm going to just turn around and give you the number to the police because i can't investigate and i can't get involved but i will get involved after that if the police determine that it's a hate incident there's a special thing that happens we look at it a little differently i look at it a little differently and we want to discover 
you know, we want to capture patterns that may lead to crime in the future. So let us know. Please feel free to let us know. Uh, don't just go on social media and post about it and that's enough. No, tell the police if there is something that is dangerous, if you think that there's something that might lead to future violence or future crime. Um, that's all I'm going to say now because I think I don't want to, I don't want to take up too much time, but thank you all very much. And uh, the best way to reach me always is my email. I think that it's like right here, andy.solomon at lacity.org. Okay, thank you very much. It's S-O-L-I-M-A-N, the last Correct. name. Because sometimes I, it doesn't show up on the screen. Oh, it doesn't. For the well, audience, you guys yeah. got to hover your mouse. Come on, guys, like hover your mouse over me for a little bit and then look at it. Okay. S-O-L-I-M-A-N. Hey, thank you, Bob. Hey, Bob. Hey, Bob, can I chime in on something uh, with Andy on, on yeah, this? Sure. So, uh, Andy, it's uh, it's Matt Epstein. So, um, Sherman Oaks Homeowner Association got quite a few calls about the Woodman during um, the pandemic, the shutdowns, and uh, about um, not being good neighbors as far as uh, a lot of different instances that were going on. And there were different uh, members that, that spoke to the Alcoholic Beverage Commission, spoke to the police department. And during that time period, um, they were up for a, a, a CUP, an extension on their CUP. No, no, no organization from the city, no organization came out and they were granted a either a five year or a 10 year extension on their CUP. Um, so, and, and, but all these different organizations within the city knew that, that there was a problem as far as the management of this particular location. So it just makes, you know, when the head's not talking to the tail, um, it makes your job harder. It makes the police department's job harder and it makes alcoholic beverage commission's job harder. But if no one's talking, if no one's communicating, um, these types of things will, will continue to happen. So just, I just wanted to chime in on that because, uh, the, the members of the community knew that this was a problem, uh, facility and management. And, uh, we continue to share that with their, or some of the different folks were, were sharing that and nothing happened. I appreciate you guys sharing that. I'd ask that maybe share it with me as well next time. Um, I do view things with a different lens. I am looking at public safety issues, whereas maybe the city council is looking at that, but looking at several other issues. Um, I'm targeting public safety. Once something is not a public safety issue, I don't mind whatever happens and that's, that's for the city. So feel free to let me know if you guys think it's a public safety issue and that I can be, you know, we can coordinate the head and the tail working together um, and we can get out ahead of these issues. I, I am aware of issues that happened at the Woodman prior to the shooting. I was working with LAPD Vice on some issues there. And when the shooting happened, I, I felt like, you know what, we were kind of, we need, we need to get out ahead of this stuff way sooner. I did not know it was a potentially violent uh, environment. Well, uh, yeah, nobody, I thought yeah. it was just small little violations that we were addressing. Right. So please feel free to let me know. Matt, you know, you have my number and you can call me whenever. Yeah, Thanks, and, and if you see the community saying that, please let me know. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Thanks a lot. Next, we're going to have Ryan Ahari from uh, Assemblymember uh, Nadrin, Nadrin Nazarian's office. Okay, thanks, Bob. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Ryan. I'm the Sherman Oaks Field Representative for Assemblymember Nazarian, um, and I wanted to give you all a report for tonight. Uh, so we had some really exciting news the other day. Um, for the last five years, the assembly member has been a really big proponent. He's been the assembly's loudest advocate uh, for college education savings accounts for children. And the governor announced that he will be pledging uh, to spend at least $2 billion on creating a program that will give 3.8 million uh, low income students at least $500 in college savings. Uh, there are a lot more stipulations in this. If you want the policy sp uh, specifics, please get in touch with me. Of course, I'll leave my contact information in the chat. Um, but money will give, be given every year to students so that they can continuously invest this to prepare them uh, to afford college. Uh, Cal Matters today published an op-ed written by the assembly member. The assembly member uh, decided to focus on the topic of uh, the future of aging and making sure that we have equity and the appropriate investments in aging. Uh, we are, uh, the assembly member is the chair of the long-term care and aging committee in the assembly. So it's really important that we get our voices heard and we, we push policy proposals that are really important to our district and our community. 
I also wanted to say that we're very focused on the budget. The May revise uh, was, was uh, released just a couple of weeks ago, I think last week by the governor. The legislature has until June 15th to vote on this. Uh, again, very exciting news. The member is both a member of uh, the Appropriations Committee, which is taxation, as well as the Budget Committee, deciding where that money goes. So really important that we have someone um, to represent us on both those committees. So we'll be making sure that our priorities on housing, education, healthcare, they're all being heard um, and they're being uh, making sure that we have our input uh, in the process moving forward. So those are our priorities for the budget. Um, I did want to also mention that the assembly member, the ongoing unemployment crisis and all the issues that come with EDD, the assembly member recently met with the director of the EDD uh, and our office shared a list of concerns that we've had with all of the different issues that all of our constituents and customers have been experiencing. So it was a really great meeting because it was our chance to let the EDD know what they can do better and making sure we're holding those accountable, making sure that customers are getting their money uh, at a time when they're unemployed in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and then the assembly member is also part of an EDD working group. This is a coalition of other assembly members and senators who regularly meet with EDD to make sure that we are doing everything we can to uh, uh, update and improve the agency. The member alongside his other colleagues have introduced about nine bills to overhaul and reform EDD. So this is gonna be one of our top priorities also moving into the legislative cycle. A um, couple more things. We partnered with the Small Business Administration um, as well as the LA Chamber of Commerce uh, to provide a workshop to the community. Uh, we did it over Zoom and it was focusing on the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, which is funded by the federal government. And it's specifically giving grants to businesses that serve food and drink. Um, and so we did that about two weeks ago. Um, and I know that a lot of folks have been asking our email, our, our, our office has been getting a lot of emails and calls on SB 9 and 10. Uh, so I do want to let everyone know that as of right now, the member opposes SB 9 and 10, specifically with the way that they are written right now. Of course, bills do change. Bills will go through the committee process. I think uh, the SB 9 and 10 were voted out of different Senate committees just a couple of weeks ago. So they're making their way through the legislative process. Our team, including myself, are monitoring these bills um, and seeing what, uh, you know, what direction they're headed in. But we're monitoring these bills and as of now, uh, the way that they are currently written, as the member has previously opposed SB 1120 uh, and standing in opposition to these kind of bills, he opposes SB 9 and 10. And finally, if anyone wants to get in touch with me on any state agencies, uh, if there's any issue that anyone is experiencing with the Franchise Tax Board, the DMV, uh, with their college, uh, uh, with their with their educational institution, anything at the state level, um, I'm your person to go to. Um, if you have unemployment benefits that you're not actually receiving benefits for, but you're on unemployment, uh, please get in touch with me. I'm more than happy to help figure out whatever the issue is. And even if it's something that's not state related, I'm still happy to, uh, to speak with Alex or any other office that would have a better idea of how to solve an issue. So I'll be leaving my contact information in the chat and I'm available for questions. Thanks everyone. Okay. Thank you very much, Ryan. And thank you for the nice lead into Maria, who's going to talk about SB 9 and 10. Yep. Thank you. I'm glad I wasn't following Andy Solomon. Uh, because my report is just totally tame by comparison. Um, so yeah, SB 9 and 10, um, you all know these bills. They are now in the Appropriations Committee and they're in the suspense file. So tomorrow is the deadline for these bills to leave the committee, uh, which means one of three things can happen to these bills. Uh, they'll be left either one, they can be left in the suspense file, which basically kills the bill or they can be made into two-year bills so they can continue to be amended, or they may pass this committee and go directly for a full Senate vote. Um, so I wanted to just explain to everybody that the people that are really promoting these bills are wealthy land investment companies with very well-funded lobbying groups called YIMBY and Abundant Housing who are fighting us for our neighborhoods and for deregulation of our zoning so more can be built on each lot. Uh, recently, a Wall Street Journal article 
uh, was titled, If You Sell a House These Days, The Buyer Might Be a Pension Fund. Uh, in a study done in UCLA, they found that huge amounts of properties had been purchased after the 2008 recession by corporations that have turned these properties into investment vehicles. In the poorer communities, these companies have bought houses and they make money by charging higher rents. And in wealthier neighborhoods, they make money on the appreciation of land. So now we have international land speculators that compete with young home buyers, making the market permanently expensive. The funded housing lobby recently put out claims that upzoning is a means to bring diversity, which we could not be, which could not be further from the truth, as we have seen in Culver City and the Arts District. People are being shut out of neighborhoods because they're too expensive. The Urban League has come out against these bills, claiming they will expose communities of color to predatory developers. And we have many of these communities as members of United Neighbors that we started, uh, and they are very opposed to these bills. So more upzoning has never brought down housing prices. We need to solve the affordable housing price problem, and we are ready to become uh, partners in trying to figure that out. So we have in the United Neighbors group, um, a vision committee that is working with developers and affordable housing people. So maybe we can come up with some ideas. So please get involved. Don't stop communicating with our Senator uh, Hertzberg who has opposed 10. Um, he is still not opposed to nine. Uh, Adrian Nazarian we thank because if the bills remain the same, um, he opposes both and council member Rahman has come out uh, opposing nine. So we continue to try and amend these bills with our senators and uh, we'll keep you informed on what goes on with these bills. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Uh, I'm going to do the next uh, information on Metro. As you know, the Sepulveda Transit Corridor Project is uh, the major, probably the most major transit program in the county. And it's going to go from the valley to the west side. It's either going to be a subway or it's going to be a monorail or it's going to be what we call in a very derogatory fashion, a halfway, which is a concept that Bechtel proposed to Metro where it's underground on the west side, it's underground through the pass, but it comes above ground and runs along Sepulveda Boulevard elevated 30 feet in the air for five miles and will basically ruin Sherman Oaks and about 15,000 people's uh, places that they live. Uh, if you can imagine a train when they get going full bore, uh, they're predicting a train every 45 seconds every 90 seconds in each direction. So every 45 seconds, a train would go by your window in an apartment building, which would be just a wonderful event. We've talked to our council member, Nithya Raman about this. And uh, just wonderfully on Sunday, uh, council member Raman contacted myself and Jeff Calvin, who's been working on me with this. He's from the Sherman Oaks Neighborhood Council. And on Sunday, we met council member Raman and her deputy chief of staff, Andrea Conant. And we spent a little over an hour driving and walking the route and showing her exactly where it would come out of the hill. Uh, if you happen to live anywhere near uh, Valley Vista and Sepulveda, you, if this concept goes through, you can expect a 40 foot diameter train tunnel popping out of the hill at that location and shifting onto Sepulveda Boulevard after it takes out about a hundred condominiums and five small businesses and a parking structure by eminent domain before it starts to run up the center of the street and block traffic. But other than that, it's a great idea. So the council member was very understanding about it and we're continuing to work with her and we very much appreciate it. For those of you who want to know a little bit more about what's going on, we've been pestering Metro to tell people, and they're going to hold a luncheon with Metro meeting on June 8th from 12 to 1. Uh, we will be sending out information on that to all our members uh, in email blast, so you'll know how to join. 
but you're going to get one hour's worth of information from Metro on what's going on with this very, very complex and very, very important project. So uh, with that, I'm going to now go to Alex Nassif, who is our Sherman Oaks Field Deputy for Council Member Nithya Raman. Thank you, Bob. I'm so excited that the council member was able to come out this past weekend. I've been pulling her arm, you know, asking her to come to Sherman Oaks. So I'm glad she made it out over the weekend. You pulled I, real hard. It worked great. Yeah, <laughs> I will try to make my uh, long updates very brief. Thank you for giving that Metro update. Um, over the last couple of weeks, the city council budget committee has been reviewing the mayor's proposed budget. We are very excited and encouraged um, by the budget's investments in restoring many of the essential services like street services, sanitation services, um, addressing homelessness and providing alternatives to policing and public safety. Public safety. Another thing we're really excited about is um, that our office requested and received is a multidisciplinary team dedicated to serving um, those experiencing mental health and substance use issues of unhoused residents in our district. Our multidisciplinary team will be composed of five specialists representing mental health, phys physical health, substance use, case management, and peer support. The LA City Planning, uh, Planning Department is proposing the Ridgeline Protection Ordinance, which aims to better preserve and protect the city's ridgelines both the nature and the wildlife um, in our hillside and canyon communities and neighborhoods. Um, to submit any questions or comments, please reach out to me and I will forward those to the planning department. Um, this summer, we will be um, one of the only elected offices in California to host California Climate Action Corps Fellows and we're looking to hire them now. CCAC Fellows will work with us for 300 hours from mid-June to mid-August and receive benefits including a $4,000 stipend and a $1,300 Siegel Education Award. Um, please feel free to reach out and email me for more information on that. Um, for more neighborhood specific updates, I've received a lot of emails and correspondence about the abandoned buildings on Sepulveda and La Meda. Um, I am aware and um, working hard on this issue. The Department of Building and Safety issued an order to comply uh, by May 31st for the specific location. The owners are also aware I've been in constant, sorry, my dog is going crazy in the background. Uh, the owners are very well aware um, all the demolition permits have been approved for this location. They are only waiting for the final approval from QMD to proceed with the demolition. Uh, please feel free to reach out and I will share my email and phone number in the chat. Regarding the recent shooting at the Woodman a few weeks back on May 2nd, um, I have been working very closely with senior lead officer Saldana and um, Azarian, as well as Andy Solomon. Um, I also am working very closely with the Neighborhood Council Plum. I know Matt I believe you brought this up earlier, but our office is definitely aware and um, considering what amendments can be made to the CUB as um, you know, the Woodman, it's kind of been some repeat offenses that have gone on at this location and we're very much aware and hoping to change uh, the negative impacts that it's had on its neighbors in our community. I am having my first community meetup tomorrow at 5 p.m. on Zoom. So I hope you all have registered and signed up and um, we can have a community discussion tomorrow. And uh, again, email me for that link and um, flyer to sign up. And our office this Saturday is hosting a spring cleaning drive. Thank you so much to Sonk outreach members, Kira Durbin and Pamela Harris, who have been really instrumental in orchestrating this spring cleaning drive. We will be collecting donations in front of the Sherman Oaks Field Office, which is located at 14930 Ventura Boulevard from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. this Saturday. We will be collecting um, 
men's and women's adults clothes, bags, backpacks, and shoes to give to those in need um, to support our office's individual outreach efforts. And Jules, that community cleanup is coming. I'm having a meeting with Kathleen early next week of the Sherman Oaks bid to discuss all of her amazing past efforts with community cleanups and how we can replicate that in the coming weeks. And as always, please continue to file those 311 requests for bulky items, trash, graffiti, et cetera. And thank you so much, all of you, for being my extra set of eyes and ears in Sherman Oaks. And I will put my contact information in the chat. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. And now we're going to go to our keynote speaker, who is Council Member Kevin DeLeon. Uh, before you start, Kevin, I, I'm hoping, you know, I happen to have been following you, your career for a long time and have met you several years ago and everything, but if you could give a little background about yourself, uh, including what you have done and what you're doing right now, and even what you might plan to be doing in the uh, mayor's race, if that's appropriate at this time, so we could hear about it. Uh, we would, uh, we'd appreciate our people, you know, like to know a little of, of your background and all of that. And then on the topics that, that I know you're going to cover in detail. So don't forget to unmute. Okay. Sure. Thank you so very much. And I want to say a couple things. One is, is, is good evening to, to each and every one of you. And it's genuinely a pleasure to be with you all, all here tonight. And I think your long history representing you know, Sherman Oaks is, is pretty much legendary. You know, long before there was neighborhood councils and, and homeowner associations were the norm, yours was among the most organized, it was among the most engaged, and without question, you've been at the forefront of, of shaping your neighborhood and ensuring that it remains beautiful. So thank you for having me, you know, here this evening. I think the last time I was with all of you was at Notre Dame High School in the cafeteria you know, some years back when I was the president of, of your California State Senate. And I miss you all very, very much. And it's, I'm hoping that we will see each other very soon. I've got my, my two shots already, my second one just last week, you know. So to, to Mr. Richard Close, you know, the, the Valkyrie of the Valley, to, to our Vice President, Mr. Epstein, uh, of course, to you, Mr. Mayor, you know, the Jules, you know, fear the entire board of Sherman Oaks Homeowners Association, you know, uh, Maria and, and, and Tom and, and again, Matt, thank you so very much. Um, Bob Anderson, of course. Now, a couple things is I have no question. I have no question that all of you are aware of the humanitarian crisis that is homelessness facing Los Angeles. And there are over 41,000 unhoused people living in our city in any given night. And for me, homelessness is the moral crisis of our time. The, the lack of cohesion between government bodies and policies has quite frankly, fail to deliver the tangible results that we want on the issue of homelessness. Now, I'm no stranger to this issue because while I served as the Senate President Pro Tem of your state Senate, I authored Senate Bill 1206, which made it to the ballot, Proposition Number 2, No Place Like Home, where voters passed Prop 2, and it provided $2 billion, not one, but $2 billion with a big B, for the construction of, and rehab of permanent supportive housing for those who are chronically homeless, who are severely mentally ill. It's a long way to, to mitigate the homelessness, but local bodies have become very complacent with the status quo of developing housing. And today I represent Council District 14, as you know, the most unhoused Angelinos in the city. Now, Bob, I have more unhoused folks than the cities of Chicago and Houston, the third and fourth largest populated cities in the entire nation. And I believe what is missing is a North Star a very clearly defined objective and a timeline for achieving that objective. That North Star is also a way for the voters, all of you in Sherman Oaks and elsewhere, constituents to hold us elected officials accountable for delivering results. So back in January, a proposal plan that I call a way home. A way home is a comprehensive overhaul of outdated and very cumbersome city policies and regulations that have obstructed the development of safe, and affordable housing units. But changing policies and regulations is simply not enough. Institutional priorities need to change to reflect the urgency of the problem. Away Home also seeks to set a goal of developing 
25,000 homeless housing units all by the year 2025. But ironically, you know, even the effort to get the city to adopt this goal is being bogged down in committee. What I'm calling, what I'm fighting for is transformational change in the way that will tackle the issue of homelessness in LA. And in no way, shape or form, I think we all agree, should housing units cost upwards of 500, 600 or $700,000 per unit. This is simply unsustainable and won't put a dent into the homelessness crisis in LA. And to be honest, I've, I've taken a lot of heat from those in the industry who are afraid of me challenging the dysfunctional uh, broken system. But look, not all of the news around homelessness is bad. And, and I'm optimistic you know, about the governor's proposal announcement you know, last week, just to, to invest a minimum threshold of $12 billion statewide for this homelessness crisis. As you all know, some of you may know, last week I, I led a march in Skid Row, uh, two weeks ago, I should say. And uh, I asked the state of California to invest in unprecedented $20 billion. So I'm excited to see the government, the governor, I should say, move on this, uh, especially for Skid Row, which is ground zero nationwide for homelessness. But if we're going to be honest with ourselves and with the public, there is real work that needs to be done before we actually produce the units that we need rapidly. Let me reiterate and make my point. A monumental investment into homelessness doesn't automatically translate into the number of housing units we desperately need. If we accept the idea that the only problem has been a lack of funding, then we're admitting we're okay with how we currently develop housing units in Los Angeles. I, for one, do not agree with that perspective. It costs too much. It takes too long. And every community in Los Angeles knows it, sees it, and experiences it. And I think we can and must do better for our unhoused neighbors and the taxpaying residents of the city of LA. You know, Matt, you know, Epstein, you know, said a few words with regards to, you know, um, what is happening with our restaurants and the city must adapt to the rising challenges of the future, especially as it pertains to the issue of climate change, for example. And LA has been a city built on cars. We've known for decades that cars are polluting the air we breathe in LA, especially in the Valley, not only in poor communities, but in all of our communities, but especially acute as we see that brown ozone haze in the Valley. We've got to move quickly to build the infrastructure that will accelerate the transition to electric vehicles, whether those vehicles are for personal use or, or fleet vehicles for large businesses such as FedEx or UPS or US Postal Service. We've got to make charging stations ubiquitous, just like gas stations. We owe ourselves you know, a, a, a local infrastructure that will make LA stronger economically, while at the same time be a leader in curbing our greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 and CO2 equivalent. Uh, that means building smarter, that is building greener. And before I pass the landmark SB100, a bill that commits California to 100% renewable energy all by the year 2045. People told me that was crazy and they couldn't get it done. But we got everybody in the room and we did in debate if we could do it. We worked together to determine how we would do it. And I think the same you know, mindset needs to be applied to our local approach to infrastructure. We know it needs to be done. We know we need to set a goal and a timeline and go to work on how to make it happen. Right now, you know, I've even been criticized in my own community uh, for a bus line going through the, the community of Eagle Rock. And I'm not against buses, uh, but I've told Metro the need to go back and return with a, a plan that's consistent with features that the community lays out in previous meetings. And I've always told them that they need to do great, greater outreach with the community so we can develop consensus. And I don't believe we can move forward on good policy unless we make sure we make a real tangible effort with community engagement. At the end of the day, we may disagree, but it won't be for lack of, uh, in, uh, lack of engagement. You know? So let, let me say the following, is as is, 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 is Bob, you had mentioned, you know, I had the, the, the wonderful fortune to come down to, to Notre Dame High School, to the cafeteria, to, to, to speak with each and every one of you. And at that time, I was the leader of your California State Senate. You know, I was born in Los Angeles, so I'm an Angelino. Uh, I was raised, you know, a couple hours south of us in, in San Diego, California, uh, in a neighborhood called uh, Logan Heights, which is very similar to, to, to Boyle Heights, uh, that great historic community uh, with a lot of uh, a large enclave of Ashkenazi Jews uh, who immigrated from Eastern Europe coming to America and, 
in settling it in Boyle Heights. Uh, my mother was a housekeeper. Uh, she cleaned homes in a very wealthy enclave uh, in San Diego, La Jolla, La Jolla, California. And I can remember as a, as a young child taking the number 34 bus with my mother. And my mother and I would get off the bus, you know, in La Jolla, and we would walk up, you know, about a mile, mile and a half, perhaps, to the hills with a the amazing panoramic views of the Pacific Ocean. And there, my mother would spend the vast majority of her day, if not the vast majority of her life, cleaning other people's homes. And it was there that I learned uh, uh, about the value of hard work. And my mother's very strong work ethic, because as a woman, she, as a single mother, she was both mother and father who paid the roof over my head, that rent, so the food on the table, the, the clothes on my back. So I owe a tremendous amount, if not everything, you know, to my mother. The first one to graduate from high school in my family, uh, the only one to graduate from high school in my family. And I can tell you all this, all, all my good friends at, at the Sherman Oaks Homeowners Association, I never thought in my wildest dreams, ever fathomed very thought that I would run for office. I, I, I was not a spectacular student by no stretch of imagination. In fact, if, if any of you, Bob and, you know, Tom and, you know, Mr. Mayor, you know, Jules, you know, Maria and Jeff, you know, if you were to come observe me in elementary school, I don't think you'd walk away, you know, with a, uh, with a, a favorable impression. I wasn't that of an impressive, you know, young man. I was just quite ordinary, nothing spectacular. You know, when you, you kind of walk into a classroom, you say, that young man is going to be president of the United States. So that young woman is going to be the first woman president of the United States. If you looked at Kevin, you wouldn't walk away with any impression at all whatsoever. And it was nothing spectacular. I was never, I was never elected, you know, class president. So I was never elected, you know, a senior class president, prom king, ASB president, young college democratic president. Even, you know, in college, you know, when you have a large classroom auditorium, you have the professor and the TAs, and you sort of cluster to groups and among your own peers, they select who's going to report out to the larger class. Well, guess what? I wasn't even elected for that, you know, among my own student peers, you know. So, you know, I just fell into politics uh, 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 haphazardly, very luckily. But one thing I, I've dedicated myself, Bob, and I'll, I'll conclude at this. I've, I've always wanted to move policies that help improve the human condition for all individuals, you know, regardless of who you are, regardless of where you come from, regardless of the color of your skin, and who you love, which God you pray to. And, and yes, your legal status is. Again, the youngest child, single immigrant mother. I'm proud to have made California the the the, the first in, you know uh, state in the country to legally, statutorily uh, dedicate itself to 100% clean renewable energy. That means decarbonizing our grid with Southern California Edison, PG&E, uh, SDG&E, or our own LADWP uh, by the year 2045. We're the largest economy on planet Earth to legally, statutorily commit ourselves to that goal. We will get there probably 10 years before. 2045, you know, uh, uh, senior citizens are, are very near and dear to me. And that's why I created a financial product, uh, the first of its kind. It's called SB1234. It's called CalSavers, if you Google it. It's the first financial product of its kind for those individuals who don't have a defined benefit or defined contribution at their place of employment, a defined benefit pension plan or a 401k plan. And that, you know, if, if you're at a place of employment, uh, you will have you know, automatic payroll deduction, automatic enrollment. And guess what? For folks like Matt and others, the employer doesn't have to contribute. If you wanted to contribute, you can't contribute nonetheless because that changes the complexity, right? No contribution. Empl it is the employee, himself or herself, that makes the contribution. And the point I want to make here is behavioral, you know, modification because quite frankly, in a lot of neighborhoods that, 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 that I, I've represented, neighborhoods throughout the city of LA and throughout the state of California, not everyone has a Charles Schwab, a T. Rowe Price, you know, uh, in their neighborhoods. Uh, they can get on their laptop and say, I'm going to open up and, you know, get a, a Roth IRA or an IRA, or I'm going to get a 401k plan or 529 plan for my kids. So uh, automatic enrollment, automatic payroll deduction, you kind of sort of forget it, you know, and you see that nest egg kind of growing and compounding over a course of time. So when you're getting close to that retirement age, you have some money saved. And the thesis, the, and I'll find out, the thesis behind this was my aunt, who's my second mother. She's 86 today. She's my second mother. She's my, my mother's uh, 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 older sister. One day, uh, mindlessly, I just asked my aunt in her 70s at the time, why do you 
do you continue to work? Why are you cleaning homes in Coronado? And she looked at me and she had that look like, I can't believe you're an elected official. You would ask me such a question. How dumb. Yeah, that look, that's what she was saying to me with her eyes. And she says, I'm working still because I have to. And I said, but I don't understand. I've seen you work all your life, fingers to the bone. Don't you have a pension plan of some sort? She says, I have nothing. She has social security and that's it. So that means a woman who's worked all her life only has social security to pay her rent, her medication, her bus pass, discounted because of her age, and food. So I give her a check on a monthly basis. So I'm her Roth IRA, I am her IRA, I'm her pension plan on a monthly basis. And I thought about my story with my aunt because it's not unique. There's millions of our own senior citizens who worked their fingers to bone all of their life. And when they retire, they retire into poverty until your arms are waste, their shoulders get out, you give out because they don't have a fixed asset, uh, whether it is real estate property or other types of financial instruments that you utilize to invest in, whether it's a compound and grow in interest over the course of time that they know how much money they have on an annual basis. And that's why I created a Cal Savers program. And it doesn't make a difference. If you live in Sherman Oaks, if you live in you know, Tarzana, if you live in Encino, Pacoima, you know, uh, Ball Heights or Brentwood, you know, uh, this is who I am as an elected official, listen to all folks. You know, uh, you all know that in 2018, I ran for the US Senate to be your representative of Washington, DC. Came that close. I came that close, you know, to being your US Senator uh, uh, against Dianne Feinstein. I got a lot of support from the Valley, a lot of support from Sherman Oaks. I, I thank all of you from the bottom of my heart. And for those of you who didn't vote for me, well, you owe me one, I'll say that. You can chalk it up on that, right? You owe me one right there. but. You know, Bob, I, I thank you very much for the opportunity that you've given me along with, you know, our president, Richard Close and Matt Epstein and, 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 and to each and every one of you that uh, I'm hoping to see you very, very soon in person in the cafeteria at Notre Dame High School, you know, and uh, more than happy to answer any and all questions to the best of my ability, the answers I may not have for you uh, right now, I'll do my best to get it for you and we'll, you can submit it to all the folks, but from the bottom of my heart to all the good folks at Sherman Oaks, uh, Sherman Oaks Homeowners Association, thank you very much. It's, it's indeed an honor. Thank you. Amber, and I'm going to add Jay Weitzler here, who's going to start to ask you a few questions. And don't forget the mention of the uh, mayoral race. Yeah. <laughs> you can go ahead and do that. You can squeeze that in any time. But I, the first thing I wanted to thank you for is, is the fact that, that uh, you're, a prof, you're a, a professor at the UCLA School of Public Affairs. You chose a good university when you chose UCLA to do a little extra work for. And, and you know, Jay, it's a, little, it's a little weird. It's a little, maybe a little contradiction. Well, maybe it's, it's consensus building, but I'm a professor at the Luskin School of Innovation. Uh, at, at the campus, graduate students, undergraduate students, but also a senior fellow at the University of Southern California. Oh, so it's, it's a, I'm bringing folks together, you know, in a very polarizing fashion. Okay. Listen, the first question I have is one of our members, uh, Lauren Naiman, uh, has a question about, well, let me rephrase it. He's a, a commercial landlord and he's been suffering greatly. I gather from his question, he's not a major landlord as things go, but he is a landlord and he's had to uh, give his, his tenants great breaks uh, due to COVID and he's suffering tremendously. He doesn't, you know, he has no way to cover his overhead. So what his real question is basically is, is there anything that the city is doing? I, I, you know, I realize that we all realize that you are a city council person now. Is there any program that the city has that would extend help to landlords? I mean, the city's been very, uh, very helpful to tenants and that's terrific. But on the other hand, as they work up the food chain, the landlords are the next step and they have to pay their bills too. That, that's a very good that, that that's a very good question, Jane. And let me sort of kind of maybe bifurcate, you know, I'm, I'm gonna make the assumption this is commercial property, either, you know, A, B or C and not residential. Um, I know that we're moving forward uh, uh, a lot of money that we're receiving drawing down from both the federal government as well as the state government because of their historic surplus of, you know, $76 billion. Half of that is already accounted for because of Prop uh, 98 for our K through 14, you know, public school system along with community colleges. So when we help uh, tenants who are residents, we're helping our landlords as well too. 
Because remember, when COVID, we shut down the economy due to shelter in place because of the county edicts. You know, we're talking about March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, uh, today. And all that back rent that's owned. So when we, we provide those, those resources needed, what we're trying to do is we're trying to stave off a potential new tidal wave tsunami of unhoused individuals because we're grappling with the 41,000 still today. Now, when it comes to commercial property, which I think where you were going with right here, whether it's you know class A, B, or C, um, is it, it's going to be fascinating to see how work is defined, especially for class A. You know, we're talking about high rises, skyscrapers uh, in downtown. We're talking about a premium, you know, uh, class A property. And if you know employers are going to redefine you know, employment as we know today, or they're gonna say, we like Zoom and, you know, we're looking at our ledger, you know, and we wanna, you know, uh, lower our costs. Perhaps we wanna get out of that lease and we don't no longer want to lease. And that is a big concern about class A property. You know, we've seen B and C uh, uh, shutter a lot of doors. I think Matt was making uh, an example, a lot of the restaurants that were battered. You know, tremendously, they owe their rent, you know, as well, too. So this is something I want to say that we're exploring right now, because when we start opening up our economy, it is absolutely critical. Let me underscore and emphasize, it's absolutely critical that our businesses grow and flourish, because we don't have a progressive tax system in local government. The three main pillars that we rely on, aside from fees, is we rely on property taxes, we rely on restaurant revenues, the receipts, and we know what happened with all of our restaurants during COVID. We rely on our hospitality industry, which are our hotels. And when tourism and businesses plummeted dramatically, unlike anything we've ever experienced before, we had no revenues at all whatsoever, large structural deficits within the city coffers. Now, California state government is different because they rely, you know, and it can be criticized too on the ebbs and flows of the market and what happens on Wall Street. That means that wealthy folks have a banner year and we have a banner year as a, as a result. When wealthy folks don't have a banner year, that means there's a lot less receipts and you may get structural deficits. But they get, have a progressive income tax system, which means when you all pay your taxes, when we all pay our taxes, the state is getting the, their, their cut. Local government does not get a cut at all whatsoever. And those industries have been shattered. So that's why when we open up our economy and to make the right investments for services and for goods for the city of LA, we need to make sure to Matt's point, you know, I, I just had dinner just recently on Ventura Boulevard uh, uh, in Studio City. In fact, you know, uh, uh, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the restaurant. It's like, it's a, not a sushi place, but it's adjacent to, uh, the original uh, sugar fish. It's a Japanese sort of kind of soul food, country soul food, which is right on Studio City, on Ventura Boulevard, right? And um, we need our businesses to grow. So uh, what I'm gonna say this, James, we're exploring when it comes to the property owners themselves. Uh, you know, what types of remedy can we provide that assistance? Okay, I appreciate that. You, you touch on a couple of things there I'd like to explore. You, you said something about uh, businesses learning how to, to operate at perhaps a lower overhead uh, after suffering through COVID because everybody's doing things as we are on Zoom. Now, the city's got a lot of budget issues. Has the city learned how to lower its overhead through the use of uh, some new practices because of Zoom that they can now carry on into the future? You know, we're, I know we're, the city, is, as I finish, the city, I believe, is a big uh, lessee of property as well. And perhaps in some of the lessons that, that are learned, is there a way to cut down the city overhead so that we have more budget to attach to other programs? You know, I'm I gonna make a correlation with what you just said right now, because it is an excellent point. How can we as a city, and you know, be it, you know, being a UB, being here for about six months in, in local government, um, you know, how can we be much more efficient and provide more value for our taxpayers, get more bang for the buck? Um, uh, we're in budget process uh, right now. We're budgeting, if you will, and you know, just create a, a new verb uh, 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 and adjective. Um, tomorrow we have a budget uh, uh, a meeting, budget finance headed up by the Valley's very own, you know, Paul Kokorian. 
And uh, right now, in, in we are actually discussing and negotiating uh, with our collective bargaining units the, the issue of how we define uh, the future employment. Should folks be coming into work? An issue of parking, the issue of greenhouse gases, you know, uh, uh, from our tailpipe emissions, or can they be zooming? You know, if it's physically, you know, uh, labor intensive work, obviously you can't zoom, can't Google, can't conference call that one right there. You have to be there physically to do whatever that work is, public work, sanitation, et cetera, you know, parks and, and recreation, uh, et cetera. But we're actually in the process right now of exploring that. But I want to make a correlation with what you said because I couldn't verify uh, your voice, so I can't make a duo call. You can either try again or verify your voice match settings in the Google. Is that Jay? There, there's Jay. Jay, Google right now. You know, Jay's right, I, have one, I have one of those segments. I have to mute. I, I, your voice set off my Google Echo. I have that type of voice. You know, I set off. You know, sometimes folks in different directions. You know, um, I can't get it to answer me. It answered you. <laughs> um, so. I, I think that, for example, you know, and I alluded to, you know, a, a few moments ago with regards to the the price point, which is extraordinary, five hundred, six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars per unit. Now, you've all been in the valley for a very, very long time, for decades, and I would venture to say, you know, the price valuation of your real estate today is dramatically different when when you bought your property, you know. Um, some folks were public school teachers, you know, and, and very house rich, you know, cash flow poor, you know, they may not have all that stream of revenue, but it's tied up, you know, in their property. Now, that being said, when we move forward to deal with the issue of homelessness, land cost is at a premium, as we know. It's a high premium. So we have to be very prudent in, in terms of our investments and how we do it. So I have said clearly that if we, the city of LA, as well as county, as well as state government, Caltrans, for example. We own a lot of real estate assets. Our portfolio is huge. Why don't we provide the most bang for the buck for our taxpayer and start utilizing you know, our properties that we own? We eliminate, if you will, land cost. And truth be told, and this is controversial with folks, but I've said that you know, uh, lawyers costs, consultant costs, mechanical engineer, architectural design, there should be uniformity with regards to what the outcomes are that we expect. Not, you know, what the developer is going to define because ultimately at the end of the day, it's not private sector dollars, it's all of you. Whether it's through HHH or whether through the H, you know, whatever bond that you guys voted for, whatever personal income tax increase that you voted for or parcel tax or an extension of a sales tax, like Measure M, for example. Ultimately, at the end of the day, you want value and you want to visibly and tangibly see what's real in terms of improvement. And I don't think we want the, to be known as the homeless capital of not the nation, but the entire world. How can we reduce costs and do it so in a very intelligent, thoughtful way? By the way, I'd rather have sanitation trucks parked around City Hall as opposed to tents of unhoused individuals. Now, we have to give our unhoused community members a modicum of dignity and respect, whether they live in, you know, you know, uh, Sherman Oaks and Encino and in, in Tarzana, Pacoima, Van Nuys, NoHo, you know, Chatsworth, you know, Reseda, Woodland Hills. We have to give them a modicum of dignity and respect. We have to be so very intelligent. We have to stretch those dollars because the dollars we're getting from the feds is one-time dollars. One-time dollars. It's not like that spigot is going to continue on an annual basis, you know, and that's why we have to be very smart in terms of land use because land, as we know, is at a very high premium in the city of LA. Look at the real estate market right now. And it's, it's a buyer, not a buyer, it's a, it's a seller's market. You know, some friends, you know, some neighbors, you know, loved ones, relatives, you know, throughout, not just Sherman Oaks, but throughout the city. And you see all the bids, you know, for single family homes you know, because there's no inventory. The inventory is limited to almost non-existent. And there's not really gonna be a large, you know, inventory because we're really kind of built out to a large degree, you know? So that's why in terms of homelessness, instead of competing with the private sector, you know, for high value in terms of land costs, because ultimately you all pay for it, 
let's be smart and utilize our own real estate portfolio and assets that we own as a city, as a county, and as Caltrans. So we can move with a sense of urgency, a sense of immediacy, so we can get folks, you know, on uh, with the roof over their head sooner rather than later. And it's not just about building. It's also about master leasing as well, which means we have thousands of vacancies throughout the city of LA and throughout the county, throughout the region of LA. We have tens of thousands. So if I'm homeless and my FICO score is, you know, hovering around, you know, 100 and nobody wants to rent to me, then it's either through the city or through a nonprofit agency that you get a guaranteed stream of revenue as the landlord. You will get your guaranteed stream of revenue because that's master leasing. No capital costs are involved. No land costs are involved. So that's why we can move quicker with a sense of urgency, immediacy, get folks off the street, off the upper passes, underpasses, lower passes, and put them hopefully knock on wood on a pathway to recovery. And by the way, one thing I want to say on this issue, about 70% of our unhoused community members are there for economic reasons, you know, and quite frankly, a string of bad luck. Now, I think the narrative has been that someone who's, who's severely mentally ill, you know, schizophrenic, bipolar, and drug addicted, yes, we do have those folks. I spent the day today in Skid Row, you know, uh, and then the other part of the day, I just got back, so that's why I kind of the way I am right now, yeah, in El Sereno, for those who are familiar with the 90032, you know, adjacent to South Pasadena, San Marino, Alhambra. And uh, I had about uh, uh, roughly about 100 unhoused individuals. I closed escrow. I took office in December, closed escrow December 29th on two hotels. Uh, we got almost everyone there minus two people. Two people, or well, one woman who we're working with with a lot of respect and dignity. She has her issues. Another individual, quite frankly, he's a drug dealer. And he's quite angry that we moved everyone into hotels because he lost his customer base. You know, well, shame on him, you know, because you know that when you're homeless, you're at the lowest of the low in your life. You've lost everything. And then if you have someone who's selling drugs to you while you're homeless, my God, I don't know if there's going to be a place for you up, you know, uh, in heaven, but that, that to me is the lowest you can get. Anyways, I'm sorry, I appreciate Mark. that. Yeah, uh, uh, let me sort of segue with some of the things you said. Uh, we couldn't agree more. I think most of us that that using city property to create affordable housing is is one of the best things that that, that anybody could do because it's the same thing. We already have the land, or or to use a property that's not used at all, commercial property that's not used at all, which could be converted. But let yes. me let me sort of re reach out and and ask you. This isn't a direct. Uh, job of yours, particularly, uh, that is to say, uh, SB9 and SB10. But um, there, is a, there is a motion that uh, Councilman Koretz um, originated, and it was seconded by Councilman Krikorian, and it appears to be stuck in committee at the urging of uh, uh, Nuri Martinez. And it has, the, the motion is basically to oppose Senate Bills 9 and 10. First of all, we'd like to know how you stand on each of those. And secondly, why is that stuck? And why hasn't the city council presented an opinion against those bills? Because they take away from our city councilman one of the most prime functions of your job, zoning. Why would you want to possibly give that to the state and no, no longer be able to do it on a local basis to determine what's needed and what's not needed. So, Jay, a, a couple of things. One is um, uh, uh, Mr. Koretz and Mr. Kokorin, who I have a, a wonderful relationship with, we both served together. Uh, I, at least I served with Mr. Kokorin, not with Mr. Koretz, who was a, a class before me or two classes before me in the state assembly. Um, we have yet to actually speak. You know, I've been bogged down in the, the, the finer arcane you know, details of, of, of the budget right now. But inter interestingly, you know, I'm in a, uh, a unique position, perhaps more unique than anyone in, 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 in Los Angeles, because um, one of the authors of the measure, I believe SB9 is, is, is my successor, you know, from San Diego, where I grew up. That is my, my very good friend, uh, Tony Atkins. So there are some concerns that I share. You know, and I heard, you know, throughout and I heard, you know, Maria, you know, uh, 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 speak eloquently on the issue of the equity firms uh, who have utilized new financial, you know, instruments, if you will, for investments and portfolio assets 
that perhaps may have the intended consequence of accelerating, if you will, gentrification and displacement, if you will. And, and so I have my concerns and I'm in a unique position where because she's my successor, you know, and I used to be the chair of appropriations committee, you know, uh, as well too, uh, both the Senate and as well as the assembly. Um, I will be actually having my com a conversation with my successor. It's a little different from someone who's in the assembly or I don't wanna say uh, like a rank and file member, but you know, I am a former pro tem. I'm just a handful in the history of California to be a pro tem. The last one that you had from Los Angeles was, you know, David Roberti over 25 years ago. Uh, and then I'm the, 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 one of the very few Angelinos you've ever had as pro tem. So I'm in an actually unique position. And I will say this to each and every one of you, to Jane and Maria and to Tom and Bob and Richard and Matt and, 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 and Mr. Mayor, you know, Sherman Oaks, you know, uh, uh, fear the jewels, you know, uh, that uh, I will be having that conversation with her, expressing to her what the concerns are and what the unintended consequences can be. Now, we know that we have a housing crisis. We know that we're going to have to deal with this issue because it's sort of kind of facing us right now at this moment as we speak. But we know that we don't want to move measures that have very profound unintended consequences as a result too. So we want to be thoughtful uh, as we approach, but not just move things sort of kind of in mass and sort of in a, a reflexive manner. So we want to be smart to your point, right? How we can, you know, still control our own destiny as the different if I may, connect us together. If I may, because we're, we're going to be running out of time here. No, I thought we were going to, I thought we finished at 9.30. That's what my note says right here. Well, we have, you know, we, we actually want to get the city council to cut to the chase because unless the city council speaks up for Los Angeles and says, we do not want our single family neighborhoods to be destroyed sure. or, or whatever the decision of the city council, I believe you are in a unique position. I'm really happy that you are because you do know the players up, up there and nobody else knows them like you. But we need the city council to step up unified and get a plan going. I appreciate the fact that you have personal relationships and that's great, but we really need the council to speak up and to agree with 150 neighborhood associations or more that are against this particularly prop well both of them prop nine and ten because sure. they are designed well, Senate Bill nine. Senate Bill I, I'm sorry <laughs> excuse me Senate bills nine and ten because they that are was prop 13 that was a right they, they're designed to destroy single family neighborhoods they, that's clear and to us if if our city council decides that they want to destroy city you know single family neighborhoods in Los Angeles I suppose that's our city council and you guys have that power but to give it up to the state and it's a one size fits all for every community in the state bar none hillsides coastal agricultural you name it all single family residences are up for grabs that's not going to create more affordable housing in the opinion of most homeowners and, and for good reasons that I don't feel is do, we should get into now. We need well, it's like counsel. a trickle down. It's a trickle we down. Need, well, the, that's the, our position would be at the very least that's arguable. However, what we need is our own city to take a position. And we also need to know that our council people are taking a position opposing those bills or not, whatever your decision is. So again, we'd like to know your position. And number two, we'd like to find out whether or not the city council is actually going to vote on this uh, resolution. Well, let me say this. Let me speak with, with uh, the author of the measures, the joint authors, Mr. Kaporian, as well as Mr. Koretz. Um, I will be speaking with uh, my successor, you know, uh, Pro Temp Tony Atkins. And I will get back to you, Jay and Maria, about that. Fair enough. That's, That's terrific. terrific. And okay. I think we are we are just uh, beyond beyond the allotted time. So I appreciate it. And I also wanted to thank you for uh, coming here and listening to uh, the entire program, to donating your time, and to compliment you. You are truly. I don't say this very often to give this kind of a compliment, but you are literally the American dream. I mean, oh. you're, you're, no, I mean it. Your, your description of where you came from and who you are today and what you're capable of doing today and how you represent the people that, in the way that you do, you are literally the American dream. And I compliment you on that. There's no negative to that at all. No, sure, Court. You know, that, that, that touches my heart. I, I, I thank all of you. you. 
you're, you're wonderful, you know, and um, like I said, I really want to emphasize again that um, when we really open up, you know, in, in about a month's time, you know, when uh, you guys are at, at the uh, at Notre Dame, you know, cafeteria, uh, please extend another invitation to me. I, I'd, I'd like to come, you know, uh, and, and see all of you, you know, once again uh, in person. You've always been wonderful to me. I remember the first time I, I will admit, the first time I came to uh, uh, visit you guys at the cafeteria, I was a little intimidated, you know, and you hear about the Sherman, you know, Oaks, you know, Homeowners Association. And I, I just, I was telling folks when I went back to the Capitol, I said, I just couldn't, I could not have met a, 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 a nicer group of folks who were just so sweet. And, and I remember Hertzberg telling me, you better be careful, man. You know, <laughs> so, you know, I said, those, they were, oh my God, they were wonderful. They were just wonderful human beings, you know, and I, I appreciate that. I say that I just with my friend, you know, Bob. You know, but uh, I appreciate your words, you know, Jay, and to, to the, the President Close and, you know, and to Bob Anderson and, you know, to, to Mr. Mayor, you know, Jules and Maria and, and uh, Maria's, you know, uh, I don't want to say a, a better half, but the worst half uh, being Jeff, you know, <laughs> and, and, and Tom and, you know, and, and uh, John and to all of you. Thank you so very much. And I, I thought Alex from, you know, Mithya Raman's office did a, a really wonderful job, you know, today in terms of giving a synopsis of our presentation. And listening to Commander, you know, Hamilton, as well as our, our senior lead officers, you know, uh, Mr. Sandanya, and correct me if I, I pronounced the name uh, wrong, I think uh, Mr. Azarian uh, as well, too. And uh, the young man who represents my good friend, a dream, you know, in the assembly, you know, they all did a wonderful job, you know, presenting to you and to all the, the stakeholders of Sherman uh, Oaks Homeowners Association. So a pleasure once again uh, to, to be with all of you guys and, and maybe we can go get a, a nice onion bagel, you know, on, on somewhere. <laughs> and uh, I, I just don't believe that we got the best deli, you know, in, 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 in Langers, you know, uh, yeah, those, yeah. Not in CD1. You get no Langers, argument Langers. from us there. You get no Langers. argument from us. Langers, you got it. Langers. Got it. <laughs> I'll have a number 18 or 19 any day of the week. <laughs> so I got to be the bad guy and say thank you very much, Council Member De, De Leon, for speaking tonight. We enjoyed it. I hope everybody watching also enjoyed it. And we hope to see everyone next month at our next meeting. And thank you very much. And uh, we just appreciate the whole evening. Thank bye, you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank God you, Council Member. Take care. Bye bye now. Thank you. Bye -bye Have now. Stay safe. You too. Be well.